I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, is our text. Matthew 5 is where uh, we're going to be to today. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're at Sweetwater or at McCulloch. And there's a table with Bibles uh, for those of you in Parker, at our Parker campus, that you can uh, run back there and grab one. And for all of our campuses, if you're here and you don't need, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please take one of those. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, speaking of all of our campuses, I just got to tell you, I'm excited about what God did last week. Uh, Easter, we got to celebrate the, the whole weekend. Uh, we had 22 baptisms total in all of our services. Isn't that cool? And, and at all the campuses celebrated baptism. Uh, and in fact, our school celebrated a baptism in chapel on, on Wednesday with all the kids. One of the students said, hey, I want all my friends to see that I'm professing Jesus as Savior. Uh, we had a uh, baptism at McCulloch Campus. We had uh, six baptisms in Parker. Way to go, Parker. That was really cool. And they got baptized outside in a horse trough. So, uh, you know, they kind of win the cool factor right there. Uh, and then uh, out of the baptisms here at Sweetwater, we had five that were spontaneous where people said, hey, I'm going to stick around to the next service and get baptized. And they didn't have clothes. They didn't have anything. You know, they, they just said, yep, we'll do it. We'll go home wet. And uh, so God's at work changing lives. You guys are a part of that, and I'm just rejoicing in that. And, and if you're sitting there thinking, hey, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus, and I need to get baptized, and I wanted to do it last week. I didn't have the courage to go home wet. Uh, anytime you tell us, any service we have, we would love to schedule a baptism. So if you wanted to proclaim Jesus as your Savior and Lord so the whole world knows, then just let us know. We will help you be obedient to Christ. And if you're thinking, uh, you know, out a little bit, uh, first weekend in June, we're going to be doing baptisms at the lake and at the river if you're in Parker. So uh, put that on your calendar that Sunday afternoon. We want to help you uh, declare to the world that Jesus has changed your life. And, and speaking of the world, uh, I'm also really excited about our Compassion Partnership. And I know we, we shared this a couple of weeks ago and just kind of told you a little bit about it. Uh, we're, we are raising $75,000 to build a church compassion center in Honduras. That's the total cost. And uh, <laughs> hey, I appreciate the applause. I want your money. And uh, can, can, we, can it just be, you know, blunt about it? Uh, we, we committed to this. It's not, it's not in our budget this year. We'll probably work it in uh, in the future. But uh, this is just us saying, hey, we want to see this happen. A lot of you already sponsor Kids of Compassion, and that is awesome. And so you already believe in this endeavor. Uh, 75000 is the goal. Uh, we've already got a little over 5000 raised. So if uh, that's something that God lays on your heart, then Robert already told you how to give. Uh, and I just want to encourage you to do that. Uh, and, and our goal for reaching that is the end of June. So uh, we'd love to give them the funds in hand because Compassion said, we already trust Calvary. We'll start the project. We know the funds will come. So uh, I'm just going to invite you to join with us in doing that. And then next fall, we'll have a chance to sponsor the kids that are going to be helped by that center in Honduras. So um, that's just something that I'm, I'm excited about. I hope you're excited about as well. Hey, we are kicking off a brand new series called Upside Down today. And, and we are taking a long look at the core teachings of Jesus found in his most famous message in Scripture. Uh, it's often called Sermon on the Mount. And if you grew up in church, you probably heard reference to the Sermon on the Mount. You may not know where it is. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So we're going to be spending some time here walking through this teaching. And, and I want you to know that Jesus' teachings challenge the status quo. They're always a, an affront, if you will, to conventional wisdom. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they turn common sense on its head, and, and, and actually, Jesus challenges pretty much all of the religious traditions, and, and so, especially of his day. So in truth, Jesus, uh, if you live his, follow, his teachings, if you live out what he says, then it's going to change your life radically. And in a sense, it's going to turn your life upside down. That's why we're calling this Upside Down. So uh, we're beginning by discussing our identity. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 13. The prologue of the sermon is it's what's called the Beatitudes. I encourage you to read them. 
I, I love those. That's a whole other sermon series. But uh, we're going to pick up verse 13, where he begins to get really practical about teaching. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Uh, notice that Jesus declared, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Did, did you catch that? He, he didn't encourage us to be the salt of the earth. He didn't ask us to be the light of the world. Uh, he, he didn't say, I hope that you choose to do this. He said, we are salt and light. This is our identity. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you actually believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then he is calling you salt and light. And you have to wrestle with this identity. You have to come to terms with what this means for your life because Jesus said, hey, uh, uh, you guys, us, the followers of Jesus, we are salt. We are salt. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, I could tell you about the value of salt in the first century. It probably bore most of you, honestly. Uh, they actually paid soldiers in salt in much of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Dead Sea there in Israel produces uh, a lot of salt, very valuable, especially in that day. Uh, salt was pure. People actually got paid in salt. Do you ever wonder where the phrase worth its weight in salt came from? That's where it came from. Because, I mean, nowadays you don't care how much, I mean, how, how much does salt cost? You know, go to the store, buy some. It's not that expensive, but there was a point in time when it was far more valuable than it is today uh, to people's uh, lives. And, and yet the truth of what Jesus is trying to say still applies. So what do we need to know about being salt? What do, you, what do you and I need to take away from Jesus' teachings about being salt? Well, uh, I think the first thing is touch. It's about, it's about touch. Because for salt to make a difference whether it's for flavor or for preservation, it has to touch the food. Okay? How many of you put salt on your food? Always. Okay? How many of you use a lot of salt when you're cooking? Okay? See, a lot of you do. Okay, salt people. Now, you're in a restaurant. You sit down to a meal. Uh, you're asking for the salt, right? Where's the salt? Pass the salt, please. Do you ever take that salt shaker and just set it by your plate? Say, so now it's close to the plate, so it'll have its effect. No, what do you do? You put it on the food. When you're cooking, you cook it into the food. You want the salt to touch the food, because if it doesn't touch the food, it doesn't have any uh, effect on it at all. So what does that mean? That means for us, as followers of Jesus, we actually have to come into contact with people who are far from God. Now, the tendency among many religious people especially in Jesus' day, but let's just go ahead and, and say it's true still today, is to be separate from those people who aren't like them. To pull away from the, uh, the sinners, from those people. And, and, and the problem with this is that um, it, it completely misses out what Jesus is saying about being salt. It, it really kind of turns their way of living upside down. If you read the Gospels, and of course I encourage you to do that, the Pharisees often criticized Jesus for his interactions with people who were, uh, well, what they called unclean or sinners. So uh, Jesus was anointed by a woman uh, with oil. 
because she was really thankful for grace and mercy that he'd shown her. Uh, and, and the Pharisees criticized Jesus because they said if he knew what kind of woman she was, he wouldn't let her do this. It, it, obviously, he's not a prophet because if a prophet would know and they would not let her touch him. They criticized Jesus because he went to the home of tax collectors and sinners. He ate with sinners. We think, oh, we're never like that. But I grew up in churches that warned us to avoid um, those kind of people. Those kind of people. Don't be around those kind of people. And, and in their mind, they were, they were trying to, to be helpful, but they were distinguishing, they were judging. Let's just call it what it is. People into two categories. They were putting good people and bad people. I know, no one in here has ever done that. You've never looked at somebody and said, good people, bad people. But see, that's not the designation that Jesus is using because in his eyes, we're all bad. Right? Isn't, isn't that what sinners are? Isn't that what unrighteous means? For there's no one righteous, not even one, the Apostle Paul says. Uh, so if you're, if you're trying to divide the, the world into good and bad, you fit in the bad category. I know some of you are like, but I'm a good person. You might be a good bad person. But you're still a bad person. That's what it all boils down to. See, when Jesus looks at the world, he doesn't see good and bad. What he sees are people who know him and have received his grace and mercy and people who need to know him and find his grace and mercy. So he sees people who have been found and he sees people who are lost. That's it. People who know grace and people who need grace. That's it. There's, there's not good and bad. Just those who already have received this gift of eternal life and those that he wants to bless with the gift of eternal life. So his approach is totally different. Jesus touched the world. He hung out with the unclean people. He ate with sinners and he changed lives. And then he said, you're salt. You see, you can't make a difference in people's lives if you live in isolation. Let me say that again. You can't make a difference in people's lives if you live in isolation. That, that's why, you know, one of the core values here at Calvary is connection. Life change happens in the context of relationships. And, and we need those relationships with people who are close to God and people who are far from God because Jesus wants us to invade the world so that we can take that message of hope and the good news that God loves you and forgives you and, and will change your life to people who are far from God. That's why at Calvary we care about our community. That's why we serve our community. That's why we do projects in our community. Uh, and and that's why we do all the stuff we're doing, always recruiting volunteers to go and help and serve and give and, and do. Uh, because we want to touch the lives of people who don't know Jesus. In, in other words, we do those projects so that we will be shoulder to shoulder and face to face with people who are never going to walk in the doors of this church or any of our campuses unless they know somebody and, and they get to know that you're salt. They get to know that you love them. And they get to know that God loves them because you love them. So salt means touch and salt means taste. Now you guys know that because why do you salt your food? You like the, yeah. Right? How many of you, you know, at night you got a craving for something salty, you got to get into the chips. <laughs> nobody, nobody raised their hand on that one. They're like, I'm not confessing that. My wife doesn't know that I get up. And yes, she does. <laughs> yes, she does. The, um, I mean, I don't, I don't care what man it is. You, you have not hidden your food from your wife. I, there's no way. So, uh, see, we're, we, we're here to touch the world and we're here to flavor the world for Jesus. If salt is flavorless, is it any good? No, it's just, it's just little rocks you're putting on your food. I mean, let's just be honest about it. So are we useful for the mission of Christ if our flavor is off? See, that's Jesus' warning in here. Um, if it's lost its taste, it's useless. It's useless. Now, I think there's a lot of people who no longer go to church or who refuse our invitations to come to church uh, because they've run into 
uh, well, they call themselves Christians, but I'm going to say churchgoers who, who just taste bad. Can we just call it that? Bad-tasting Christians, bad-tasting church people ha- have, have tainted it so that people go, I don't want any of that. Because if you offer me a Brussels sprout, I don't care what you did with that Brussels sprout, I'm not eating it. You know why? Because I have had Brussels sprouts. I already know I don't like Brussels sprouts. And some of you right now are thinking, oh, but if I fix it my way, but see, that's the problem. I'm not going to try it. Because I already tried Brussels sprouts and it wasn't any good. Okay, that's just me. Now, some of you are like, oh, but no, listen, I, I, it's just, that's just an example. And, and there's a lot of people who tried church, who tried Christians, who, who did that, who went and hung out, and they got a bad flavor. And they're like, no, I already tried that. And, and we're trying to win them over to try it again, to try it differently. And if we're going to do that, we've got to taste good with our lives. We've got to flavor it for Jesus. And, and if you don't know what that looks like, uh, let me just tell you what's some instances of bad tasting church people okay like if you're being cheap with the wait staff and rude with the wait staff in a, in a restaurant that that's being a bad flavor okay I, i'm just gonna tell you that i don't i don't care uh you don't have a right to be rude to people ever if you're gonna love them love is patient and love is kind and, and so if you know if you're being rude to the wait staff if you're you know that's just out of bounds that's being you know bad flavor if, if you're being cheap, you know, uh, that's bad flavor. Look, don't tip because the service is good. Tip because you represent Jesus. Look, in this culture, that matters. So tip for Jesus, not for, not for service, not for the food, all that kind of stuff. Just, you walk in there and tips are expected, then I, look, your reputation, and better, more importantly, Jesus' reputation is not worth a couple of bucks you're saving. Can I just be honest about that? And, and here's the thing. Some of you are like, well, I'm not cheap. Ask somebody. <laughs> Ask somebody who knows you, because some of you are not aware that you are cheap. But if we go to lunch and you offer to pick up the check, I'm trying to read the tip upside down to see if you're cheap or not. I'm just confessing that because I've had to go back and, like, you know, give them a real tip uh, because my reputation and Jesus' reputation are on the line. You know, th- that, that's just bad tasting uh, churchgoers, bad tasting churchgoers being mean and demanding when you're dealing with service people or any people. We already talked about that. Love is patient, love is kind. If you're supposed to love God and love people, then you got a problem with that. How about driving with road rage when you got a Jesus sticker or a Calvary sticker on your car? That's bad taste, okay? Or how about, you know, being mean to people at church? Uh, Believe it or not, Even here, even though we talk about it, there are still people who go, that's my seat. I haven't caught them. If I caught them, we'd throw them out, okay? It's not your seat. I know some of you are so OCD that you've got to show up 30 minutes early so you can get your seat. But if somebody else is in it, just bless them and praise God that they're there earlier than you. All right? Or how about this? How many of you still have, like, PTSD from going to, like, church business meetings when when you were kids? Yeah. See, some of you raised your hands. Others are like, I'm not raising my hand in church ever. They might call on me and I have to talk. <laughs> Look, I grew up uh, go, going to church all the time and, and business meetings were ugly. People got mean. They got angry. And, and if you grew up in that, you might be like, I'm not going to that. I'm not going to be a part of that. You see, our assignment is to represent Jesus to the world so that people want more of him. We just sang a song about wanting more of him, experiencing more of him. Uh, So salt is about touch and taste. And the key thought is influence. Influence. You have influence. Look, people know you, and people like you, and people trust you. And God has entrusted you with influence for his kingdom. So touch the world with the love of Christ. Be a delightful flavor for Jesus, and let God use you to draw people to him. Influence. I know some of you don't believe you really have influence, but you do. It may not be with a lot of people, but you've got a lot of influence with some people. And God wants to use your life to flavor them for Jesus. So, Jesus said we are salt, and Jesus said we are light. Verse 14, he said, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. That would be idiocy. 
but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are light of the world. What is Jesus trying to tell us about our identity as light? I think the first thing is, you know, we're talking about consistency. Consistency. Because light allows us to see when it's on. Right? You're the light of the world. City on a hill can't be hidden. Light's on, you see the city. We need it to be on, though, to see. So how many of you have ever walked through a dark room? Usually, you know, it's usually at night because that's when it's dark. And you stubbed your toe or hit your shin on something that you knew was there, but you didn't think you were going to walk into it. How many of you have had that happen? How many of you uh, have wives that laugh at you when that happens? How many of you wives want to confess that you're laughing at your because the husbands didn't raise their hands. They're afraid of you. I think the only time that Meralda didn't laugh at me doing that was when I actually I turned the light off and then I tried to step over the doggy gate. And I went down. I still have scars from that, too. I went down. It crashed. The gate went down. I went down, you know, freaked the dog out. Uh, and uh, Rodolfo thought I died because, you know, just this big crash. And I'm just laying there going, what did I lose in that? See, light needs to be on consistently for us to see. I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, you can't see if there's a strobe light on, which is a light being turned on and off rapidly. It distorts things, and, and it causes you to really not have any depth of perception whatsoever. Or, or when you're driving at night, how many of you actually keep your headlights on all the time? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hands, which means you're like, are you really driving in the dark, turning your lights off for a little while? <laughs> Just to see if you can say, oh, the moon's pretty bright, I think I'll turn my lights off. Now, I have done that for a few seconds, but I don't want to drive that way. So here's the question. Does your light shine all the time or only when it's convenient to be known as a Jesus follower? Do you confess Jesus every day or only when you're at worship and life group? Are you just as committed to living your faith on Friday night or while you're on the lake as you are when you're at church? Because light is about consistency, and light is about clarity. Clarity. Is your life shining clear and bright, or is it obscured by a bowl? See, light only serves its purpose if the vessel it's held in is transparent or clear. I mean, think about it. You know, Jesus said you don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. That would be ridiculous, because then you can't see the light. We cover our windows because we live in the desert and we don't want the light to come in, right? Big money in window treatments because we want to keep the light outside. You cover your windshield when you park because you don't want the light to come in and turn your steering wheel into a, you know, burning object, right? I mean, we do that. We shield the light because we don't want the effect of the light. And when we cover up our lives to hide our flaws and our mistakes, we hide our light. We hide our light. We obscure and distort the light of Jesus when we attempt to manage our image. We want to see, be seen by others as better than we really are. We want to look like we've got our act together, like we know what we're doing. And see, the, the churches I grew up in, the traditional religion, the Pharisees of Jesus' time, they, they said, oh, we've got to hide our flaws so that people think we've got our, our lives all together, and then they'll be drawn to the, to the church. You know, we've got to cover up our mistakes so that nobody knows that we did that stuff, so that, you know, people will come to church. Didn't work. You know why? Because it produces hypocrites. It produces churches filled with people who are afraid that people are going to actually discover who they are what they've done. They're going to judge them. And so you're filled with churches of people who are hiding and the light of Jesus is being hidden in the process. That doesn't draw anyone to Jesus. That pushes people away. See, Jesus expects us to be clear. 
to be transparent, to be honest. We let the light of Jesus reveal our flaws, shine on our failures, and illuminate his redeeming power. That's what his light does. The light shines best when it shines through our broken and restored lives. That, that, that's, when, that's when people praise God. That's when people get excited when they understand that they don't have to be perfect to be here. But it helps to be honest about who you are and about how God has redeemed your life. Now, honestly, we're not excited about the pain you went through. We're not excited about the failures that you experienced. We're not excited that you failed in some, you know, shameful way. What we're excited about is the power of God to redeem you. The power of God to forgive you. The power of God to restore your life and, and turn something broken into something beautiful. That's the light of Jesus that shines powerfully. And, and if you will, the key thought here is integrity. The key thought is integrity. Notice what Jesus says. This, this caught my attention from the first time I, I read this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See your good works. And, and by the way, give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know how I understand that? I understand that as people deciding they want to follow Jesus too. How else do they give glory to God? If they're far from God, that means they come close to God. That means they believe in God. Now, I grew up in church where they taught this the exact opposite way I think Jesus meant it. I, and, and I don't think anybody understood that. Uh, and, and so, yes, I am judging them, and I need to repent later. But here's the thing. I was taught that good deeds were all the things you didn't do. I don't smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or run with girls that do. Okay? Okay? It's all the stuff you don't do. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm shining my light by not doing bad stuff. But that's passive. That's not active. And Jesus said, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and then be drawn to Jesus so they want to praise Jesus too. And, and think about it. The great commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love passively. Love is not a passive thing that we do. That means that we need to be involved in people's lives and we need to be sharing the hope that we have. We need to be serving them. We need to be caring for them. And when we treat people with kindness and respect and dignity and, and share that hope that is real in our lives, it draws them to Christ. Because they see you as a real person who really loves God and who really loves them and who really isn't perfect, but God has really redeemed you. And then people like bugs to a light, are drawn to Jesus, and they taste the goodness of God, and they want more of it. You see, our purpose is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, that's why we exist. That's why we do what we do. That's why we celebrate the baptisms. Our identity as followers of Jesus is salt of the earth and light of the world. It's all about how we represent Jesus and how we relate to people. Now, if we embrace this identity, seriously embrace this identity, we're thinking of others more than ourselves, Jesus will turn our lives upside down and use us to lead people to that life-changing relationship with the Savior. And I think that'll change everything for us, and I know it'll change everything for them. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray right now that your spirit would move in this room because you have called us salt and light. And some of us are distant from those who are far from you. And we need to get close. We need to touch people who, who don't know Jesus. Father, some of us have lost our flavor. We, we just don't taste good uh, to the people around us. And we need you to change that, to renew us, to reinvigorate our lives, to to have us take a different path. Father, some of us, uh, we're not consistent. Our light's on and it's off and it's on and it's off and we need to shine consistently for Jesus. And Father, some of us, um, we're just not transparent. We, we don't, we're, we're afraid to be real. We're afraid to be honest about who we are. And I pray that you'd give us courage. 
courage to embrace the identity that Jesus gives us and to allow you to transform our lives, even if that means for a little while it seems like they're upside down. We can't do this on our own. We are helpless and hopeless without you. And so we ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen.